Hello, and welcome back to another episode of the Wellbe Show and Podcast. I am so very excited to have with me today, Dr. Bobby Price. Bobby, welcome. Hey, glad to be here. Thank you for having me on. Yeah, I'm, I'm so excited about this conversation. Bobby, you are a certified plant-based nutritionist, um, exercise physiologist, and a doctor of pharmacy. Not generally, you know, somebody we've had on the Wellbe show before is a, uh, a pharmacist by training. So I have a ton of questions because I know you're also an author of a book called Education Over Medication. Let me lay out a couple more things I found in your bio that I thought were just so interesting that you you know are doing what you do now with this background and that was you were the national president of the student pharmaceutical association a pharmacist at a hospital a pharmacist at walmart also at the u.s department of defense and i believe you might still work as a pharmacy director at a physician's group in Atlanta. So in addition to that, you also worked with the FDA. And I wonder how did someone with this background end up also becoming a certified nutritionist and the author of, you know, a book on plants, basically over medication, the thing that you are trained in? It really doesn't start like you just listed all my like professional credentials, but like it really started on a personal journey. I I love learning and especially about science, no matter if it's natural science or inorganic science. So I've always been a student. And um, so that's probably why my background is a little as diverse as it is. But my in my personal story, I started to get unhealthy and I was figuring out what to do about that. And I tried everything. I mean, I tried different diets, I tried different exercise regimens, being an exercise physiologist, And nothing I did really worked. And that was really sort of the point where I was willing to try anything. You know, having the education, but still using the education and not working, it just made me open up my mind to what else is available that I don't know. And so out of desperation, I decided to sort of adopt a plant-based diet for like 21 days or a month and see how it goes. And after almost years of trying to lose weight and feel healthier within about a matter of about 17 days, I I lost 17 pounds and, you know, I ended up reversing my high blood pressure. You know, that was the first little inkling that, oh man, these plants have a little kick to them, don't they? That I'm not really aware of. So that, that's really where everything started to divulge for me because at that point it was like, I know everything you can know about medications. I know everything you can know about, you know, um, diagnosing. I know everything you can know about the human body, but here it is. I don't know enough about the one thing that took 17 to 21 days to kind of change my life. And so that's when my path sort of diverged from the traditional medicine uh, approach to let me see what's down this rabbit hole when it comes to fruits, vegetables, nuts, and seeds. I had a feeling it had something to do with a personal journey. I think that happens for a lot of us where we have a personal experience and then we say, whoa, we got to, this is too important. Like we got to share this with the world because I shouldn't be the exception. I, you know, should hopefully become the norm or be the norm. Um, and so I think we could all be shouting this stuff from the rooftops for the the rest of our careers and there still wouldn't be enough people who take the time to, you know, adopt a plant-based diet for 17 days and see their life change and then actually stick with that too, which is such right. a huge, such a huge piece of it. So when you had that light bulb moment, how long was that five years ago, 10 years that ago? That was 2011. Okay. So about nine years ago. Yeah. What were your main beliefs about conventional medicine, especially pharmaceuticals up to that point? And based on your training and kind of, you know, how has it changed? Well, I mean, at that point, I thought it was the bee's knees. I mean, if anybody came into the hospital and they were newly diagnosed with high blood pressure or diabetes and they were getting that first prescription, they would always ask like, is this something I could get off of or what do I need to get off of this? And I would tell them just like any other doctor would tell them, this is something unfortunately you're gonna have to take for the rest of your life, but it's gonna help maintain and balance your blood pressure, your blood sugar. And so I gave that advice out readily and often. And so 
to my understanding, that was the only way. I mean, that was all we were taught. You know, with all the education I had, it didn't matter. Like, that's all we were taught. Uh, of course, you needed to exercise and eat good. And I use quotation marks because, like, I think we don't define what eating good is. And so people have a very loose idea about what eating good is because I'll ask people that and they'll think because they eat tuna, they're eating well. And so, you know, for me, that's sort of what my initial ideas were. I mean, I love everything about chemistry, even again, like everything about chemistry on the synthetic side and the organic side. I just love chemistry. But I just, at that point, I had only been taught that medicine was everything. And, you know, like I said, in 2011, when I went plant-based and I had been diagnosed with high blood pressure when I was 16. And this was despite the fact that I was an athlete in high school. I only had about 5% body fat. I was very fit and I still had high blood pressure. So I chalked it up to heredity. And, you know, so I lived with high blood pressure for over a decade before I really out of desperation chose to do plants for only 21 days because after the 21 days in my mind, that was gonna be up. Um, but in 21 days, my blood pressure got lower than what I had always been sort of used to it being. And I had lost again, about 17 to 21 pounds in that 21 days. And so, you know, at that point, that's when the philosophy shifted. I was healing myself or the plants were healing me. And now my whole philosophy about what healing is and how you go about doing that shifted because now I'm starting to feel like a hypocrite to my patients. And I wanna share the information but now I have to share the information on top of giving them the information about medication. So that's where sort of the contradiction and a lot of the sort of internal battle started with me. That must be such a weird feeling because uh, you know that you would need to give the medication if you had given the information earlier or if they really took the information seriously that second but right. because you can't count on that and because of your training and whatever you know what your job is and the protocols there you're handing out the medication too which is basically like you can heal yourself but also you can't heal yourself and it's like right <laughs> it's, it doesn't match like you can't have both that duality um, yeah or like just take this and like the numbers will correct but then you should also heal yourself but who's gonna kind of go do the hard work when they just found the shortcut Exactly. Or the, so, or the, you know, Band-Aid or whatever we want to call it. That all seems, those questions. Right. That seems to fix it, but they're not thinking so far in the future to know that it, it doesn't. So that, yeah, I can see how that eventually just a few times of doing that, you'd be like, this is completely ridiculous. Like, I can't do these two things at once. They contradict each other. I want to ask you about your experience at the FDA. So what exactly did you do with them? And how did that experience shape your background and influence, you know, how you think and what you're doing today? Yeah. So at the FDA, I worked in their CEDAR division, which is their Center for Drug Evaluation and Research. Uh, so essentially what they do is research in that area on drugs. But when I worked there, um, I was basically given a small a small program, which was a 1-800 number that patients could call in who felt like they were injured by drugs or had side effects from drugs. And so basically what I was doing was collecting data from people who either, again, were injured or had side effects from drugs. And so wow, as I find it hard to ever take a drug again after that job. <laughs> <laughs> right. I mean, yeah, because it gives you a very narrow perspective because the only time people are going to call is when they've been injured. Right, yeah. and the things you must have heard, you're like, no yeah. drug is worth that. Yeah, man. So, like, you know, for me, my perspective was, I, of course, I was trained to understand and know that no drug is without a side effect. But what that did was it gave me a very clear picture on how, how often people were having side effects from drugs and not only how often, how injurious they could be as well. But I think what I learned most about doing that was the fact that as I was collecting this data and trying to figure out, okay, I have all this data, like, okay, what are we going to do about this? And it was essentially black hole. There was no nowhere for me to put the data, no, nothing for us to do about it. 
And so, you know, I just kept collecting and eventually felt like it was a worthless program to me. I also participated in watching in drug approval processes and and watching how that approval process goes through, uh, along with a, a few other things. But those are the primary things that I did while at the FDA and uh, working in different departments. And essentially what I learned was that the FDA unfortunately is very underfunded. And because they're underfunded, um, a lot of the things we would hope that they would do because they're a protection agency. This is why they're here. They're to protect us when it comes to food and drugs. They're to protect us from companies uh, putting foods and drugs out there on the market that could injure us and also responsible for responding when they do. And what I learned was as unfortunate as it, it may sound is that because of financial restraint, also due to not having enough power, they don't actually don't have the power to actually fight against big pharma and big food industry. And so that was another thing that I learned very quickly there. And I also learned that earlier, um, there had been a deputy director who was, came over from a company called Monsanto. Now, Monsanto is one of the largest producers of genetically modified foods in the world, okay? And the deputy director who was there at the time had been a lawyer and one of the primary people on the executive board at Monsanto, and all of a sudden he had wound up at the FDA. And it was so, like, in terms of, like, the timing, like, he wound up there during the time when right after you know, genetically modified foods got approved to be put out into the, the mainstream market. And now he, he was to sort of help reinforce that. And so because of all those inconsistencies that I was able to see while being there, that was one of the reasons why I decided not to sort of pursue a career at the FDA. Sounds like a lot of good reasons. <laughs> yeah. Like just one of those is uh, pretty intense. I think that's so fascinating that you went from this personal experience where you saw that there was something more powerful than drugs into a role where, or maybe it was the other way around, but you know, they're, they happened so, you know, close together and coincidentally that you were seeing the more and more issues with drugs. And like, you know, you have this training and you're supposed to be working the rest of your life with drugs. And you're probably going like, I didn't want this personal experience. I didn't want this FDA realization while I was working there about how many things are really wrong with drugs and also how injurious they can be, or they are mostly. It must have been very inconvenient because like you had a plan. Yeah. Yeah. Very inconvenient truth. I mean, it's, when you think about it, like from my perspective, like before graduating pharmacy school, like this is like, for me, I thought it was going to be like the perfect job, like to be on the front end of you know, discovering new drugs, helping them being approved, you know, to be on the forefront of regulations around those type of things, not only drugs and foods, but also medical devices. So like from my perspective, I thought this was gonna be an amazing opportunity. Uh, but I, I think the unfortunate thing is like, I've always been one of those people who's, I love, like I just seek the truth and my beliefs don't necessarily matter. And I think a lot of times what happened, people think that truth and beliefs are always aligned. And for me, I look at truth with a naked eye and then I have my beliefs over here that aren't so naked. And so when I see the truth, then I have to now realign my beliefs. And that's what exactly was happening while I was working there. It was like, I was seeing this truth but I had these contradicting beliefs about what was happening. And now I had to make a decision once I seen this truth to say, okay, are you gonna align yourself with this new truth that you've discovered? Or are you gonna make the decision to say, well, I need to realign the truth with my current beliefs. And so for me, it, it just, it has never made sense to sort of realign, you know, truths with beliefs. Uh, it should always be the other way around. 
Like we saw plenty of people doing it before the election, right? Indeed. <laughs> Indeed. Like I, I've never been so impressed with people actually on both sides of the aisle's ability to take in information or, or events and find a way to reconcile it based on their political right. beliefs. I mean, I was just floored by that. I love that moment. I love the thought that these things were happening for you, um, right, you know, again, around this uh, time that you went through this personal experience. So looking through your book, you talk about um, some myths and lies about conventional healthcare and our food system that you have uncovered in your experience. If, were there any more that we didn't already talk about? No, I mean, I mean, this uh, numerous, unfortunately. <laughs> I don't even think we have a, enough time to mention, but like <laughs> some of them are like food labels. Uh, what you can and can't say on food labels, like you can literally say this is natural and there's nothing that clearly defines what natural is anymore. Even though like when you look at the truth, the truth, clearly defines what natural is, but on a food label, that doesn't mean the same. Or if something says sugar-free, it could say sugar-free, but, and I mentioned this in my book, there's over 48 different names for sugar. And so quite often when you're looking at the sugar content, you don't even know if that's the true sugar content because there's so many different names for sugar. So food labels are one myth that people live by because when they go into supermarkets, they're often often looking for those like exaggerated claims on on food labels that say things like natural and you know all organic and all these sorts of things. But many of them, if they don't, they're not backed by an agency or they don't actually have a de defined or regulated sort of um, definition. Uh, many of them ab mean absolutely nothing. So that's one myth that I'm always like trying to break down with my audience and help them understand food labels a little bit better because I think that's where we get into most trouble. So that's one myth. A uh, myth uh, that most people hear but is actually true is that medical error is actually a leading cause of death in America. And that's actually a truth. It's actually the third leading cause of all Americans. There's two different sort of studies you can look at. There's one by John Hopkins that estimates that 250,000 people every year die of medical error. There's another study that's a little bit more independent that has those numbers as high as 440. So that's like the population of Miami every year dying uh, as a result of mer medical error. And medical error, just to give people sort of an, a definition of what that is, is that's an unintended cause or outcome as a result of healthcare, okay? And in many cases, this can mean that they got the right drug, the right dose, or the right surgery on the right limb, and they still died as a result of that. So a lot of people sort of like say, think when I say medical error, they're thinking like, well, they must have did something awfully wrong. Well, that's included in there, but it also includes like they did exactly what they were taught to do as a medical health professional and the, the patient died as a result of their care. Uh, it also includes things like hospital inquir acquired infection as well. That means that you went into the hospital and as a result of being in the hospital, you got an infection as a result of the instruments that they use, as a result of the equipment, as a result of the healthcare worker. About 1.1 million people get hospital acquired infections every year. And uh, unfortunately, a lot, of, a lot of them also pass as a result of that because you have to understand when you're in the hospital, guess what? You're sick. Uh, if you're sick, in many cases, you're also going to be immune compromised. And especially if you're getting a surgery, now your body is open up and exposed to getting that infection directly into the body. So there's a long list, unfortunately, of myths, lies, and truths behind modern food and medicine. And that's essentially why I gave that subtitle to my book is because you know, in my opinion, I, I really think that most people don't really know what's going on in healthcare, the food industry, and, and big pharma. Uh, and so I try to sort of speak to a lot of those myths and lies and truths 
that uh, people are very much unaware of, but on, on unfortunately, that unawareness or that lack of consciousness about, you know, what we believe about certain agencies, what we believe about, you know, healthcare, what we believe about the food industry, uh, unfortunately, they're not in alignment with our greatest, you know, source of health or overall health. Since you first started thinking about this and realizing these truths and having to reconcile your beliefs with them, have you seen things change at all? Do you feel like things are going in a better direction or worse or the same? I honestly don't know. You know, like, and, and I say that because on one perspective, I'm a little bit out of the loop. Like I don't eat at McDonald's and places like that, but like sometimes I get off the exit and I see somebody turn into a McDonald's and I'm like, wow, like people still eat that. So on one level, you know, in my mind, I'm thinking like nobody eats McDonald's anymore, but then I go to the hospital and I see this one inside of the hospital. So on one level, no, I don't think it's getting better at all. And in many levels, I think it's actually getting worse, unfortunately because we're so far away from the truth. And what I mean by that is, even when you think about this pandemic that we've been going through, you know, for the last eight or nine months, we've been told to shelter in place, wear a mask and wash our hands, which nothing is wrong with that. But the, the only issue is nobody's had a conversation about what you really need to do is build up your immune system and get healthier. Because even in the case where you wear a mask, wash your hands and shelter in place, I still seen people get COVID. You know, I still seen people get infected. And that mask, washing their hands and sheltering in place will do nothing for you once you have COVID. And so the real conversation has to be about our health and how do we improve and advance our health? Because unfortunately, and I talk about this in our book, America is actually the sickest and the most obese country that's ever been in existence. I mean, in the entire existence of human <laughs> evolution, we are the sickest and we are the most obese. And with that being said, it, we're going to be the most immune compromised. So unfortunately, I don't think things have changed because we haven't shifted the conversation to what is the real cause. It's just like with medicine. Medicine is manipulating our biochemistry, it's not improving our biochemistry. So just because you turn off the check engine light doesn't mean that you don't still need an oil change. And that's essentially what medications are doing. They're turning off the check engine light, but it's not actually address addressing the real issue. And so because I, I believe that we're not addressing the real issues, Unfortunately, I don't believe that there's much change. It doesn't matter that people are saying, oh, we're coming out with these life-saving genetic drugs that can alter your genes. Well, the thing about nature is if you give a drug and it alters your genes, guess what? If your environment, meaning what you eat, the stress you put in your body, the lack of exercise, the lack of sunlight, the lack of enough water, that will always trump any drug is not capable of trumping poor behavior. And so because we're so far away from real conversations, I just don't believe that unfortunately, in many cases, we're not getting better. Now, there are people who are making the switch to eating healthier things, uh, living a healthier lifestyle, but you know, it's, I always get that reminder, like I said, when I either go in the hospital or I'm getting off the exit and I see a doctor at a hospital walk into a McDonald's or I just see somebody turn into a, a McDonald's. I'm, I'm thinking like my to myself, like, my God, there's still a lot of work to do. <laughs> so, yeah. I know. I, I think also once you start changing your lifestyle and your diet, you, like you said, you get so self-absorbed. Obviously, we all are all the time that your perspective, you just sort of assume other people kind of have or must get. And it yeah. takes being face to face with them, them being people that don't, you're like shocked, you know, yep. and you realize the more and more you do that, that you're kind of, like you said, you, you're holding on to this holy grail, this truth. And you're sort of like, I don't want to be an evangelist. I don't want to be annoying, but also like, I have something to tell you. Right. Right. It's, it's you such a, yeah. yeah. So I, I mean, I 
totally get why you're doing everything that you're doing based on what you've seen because you're like I just can't keep this to myself. I love the analogy you made for describing what medications do and like turning off the check engine light doesn't mean you don't need an oil change. I just thought that was perfect. So I want to ask you a couple of questions wearing your pharmacist hat. What are some of the best ways to protect yourself from the medical error that you're describing as a patient? I know myself being a holistic patient advocate, I have things that I've recommended to people, but I'd love to hear your perspective since you're you know on the side of potentially giving somebody a medical error, right? Yeah. Yeah, I always say the the first and best thing you can do is educate yourself. Don't walk into any situation where any professional without first educating yourself, because if you don't, you're not going to be able to ask questions. You can only ask questions when you have a perspective. You can only have a perspective when you have information. So never walk into a situation without first getting some perspective yourself. Uh, because the first, the first thing that happens is, is people are confused about what's going on in their bodies. And quite often like healthcare professionals don't do a very good job of explaining what exactly is happening. And so when the options are presented, they're going to be presented in such a way that it seems like it's either A or B. And in many cases, A is, take this drug or be suffer is really not anything in between. Like most, unfortunately, most healthcare professionals aren't going to give you any holistic advice. And most time people are going to want, want to take a natural route in their brain or want to take the route where they can fix themselves. But that is not the information that you're going to get, unfortunately, from a healthcare professional because they don't teach us that. They don't teach us how to teach you self-care. Okay, so you got to become an educated advocate for yourself first. And I think a lot of people do a really horrible job of doing that. And so you first have to find people like yourself, like me, who are going to first give you some level of education that when you walk into a situation um, that you at least have some inkling of what could be going on and you know the right questions to ask before you go down some rabbit hole. So that's the first and most important thing that people need to do. The second thing is people need to take or reclaim their health. Unfortunately, most people have handed over their health to the healthcare system. So they're always gonna be at the boot of the healthcare system, meaning they're always responding from a retroactive perspective instead of being proactive. And the reason why people are retroactive is because the healthcare system is really a sick care system. It only treats you when you get sick. It doesn't have you come into an annual and then nothing checks out and they don't give you information on how to continue to stay healthy. And so because they don't do that, you have to do that. You have to first become your own, you have to become your own patient first. And a lot of people aren't doing that because they've given over the health to the to the healthcare system. Now, it's unfortunate because it, once you're in the system, you're unfortunately at the mercy of the system. And many of the options that are presented, most people don't wanna go down that road. Most people don't wanna take chemo and radiation. Most people don't wanna have their gallbladders removed. Most people don't wanna go through these extreme things. But if you don't do what's necessary beforehand, you can't actually prevent a situation. You can't actually work yourself out of the situation because most of the time people go into the, the doctors, they're not telling them, oh, this is some little, you know, benign situation that you can work yourself out of. Most of the time when people show up to the doctor, it's really bad. And so like, you just don't want to do that. Okay. So become your own patient first. And then I think the third thing I would tell people is that, and I mentioned a little bit about, about it before, being a chemist, being a pharmacist, um, what I understand both about medication and food is that they both can be very toxic to our bodies. We live in a very polluted and toxic world today. The air is polluted, the water is polluted, the food is definitely polluted today. Uh, that's why 90% of the food in the market is on a shelf with an expiration date. Okay, and plenty of preservatives, plenty, plenty of pesticides. These are all things that are there to keep the food from dying. So it's like 
you know, a mortician at, you know, a funeral home. They put embalming fluid inside of uh, 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 a person who's passed because it maintains the body for a little bit longer. Well, they do the same thing with food. That's why they have all those preservatives and food additives and colorings and thickeners and emulsifiers. All of those things are to keep the texture, the taste, the look, all of those things. But unfortunately, those things will keep the food looking alive, but it won't keep you alive. So it's really important to understand that, you know, just from a, a, a conscious perspective is that you know, because everything is so polluted, so toxic today, so many metals in everything, so many xenoestrogens or fake estrogens inside of plastics and cosmetic and hygienic products, these things create a toxic load in our bodies. And I talk about this in the second chapter of my book, where once you get us to a certain toxic threshold, that's when disease starts to creep into our bodies. As long as your body can eliminate toxicity on a consistent level and get rid of the toxicity, your body will be fine. You won't have necessarily any disease. You may have like fatigue. You may have things like headaches. You may have some GI discomfort. But once your body goes beyond that toxic threshold, that's when disease creeps into the body. Okay. And so it then becomes very important to have not only a nutritious lifestyle that is cleansing, but also detoxify yourself as well. So you probably noticed that I have a herbal detox and that's why it's probably the foundation of what I recommend to people because herbs are capable of pulling things out of the body that plants can't. I mean, regular fruits, vegetables, and nuts and seeds can't. Herbs can pull heavy metals out the body. Herbs can pull things like mucus and acidity out of the body. Herbs also cleanse the body. They also nourish the body. And that's why they're bitter. They're so bitter because there's so many different minerals in them. And minerals are what make plants bitter. So, you know, a lot of us, when we were growing up, our grandmothers would give us like these little bitter, horrible tasting remedies. But many of those were herbal remedies. And the reason why they taste so bitter is because they have so many minerals in them. So, you know, the, the, the third thing I, I I, I would say is cleansing and detoxifying yourself will be a great third thing to sort of add to that prescription for yourself so that you can ensure that, you know, not only are you protecting yourself in the case that you do have to go to the hospital, but prevention is just as important. I mean, a cure becomes senseless if you prevent the disease in the first place. Yeah. Absolutely. Actually, when you mentioned, uh, herbs, I was thinking about how I read that you had traveled the world studying with herbalists, shamans, and spiritual gurus. And I wanted to ask you what that meant and uh, what motivated you to do that and what, what did you learn? Well, I lived in Japan for about four years. And while I was living there, every weekend I would go to the northern part of the island. There's a whole village of people who live to 100, no disease, eat primarily a plant-based diet, and pretty much die in their sleep. And so at, after going up there for like almost four years, getting all this wisdom from them, in my mind, I, it just made sense. Okay, I understand that this is a very unique population because even though Okinawa is a very small, small island, somehow they have the highest number of centenarians, people who live to 100, of any other place in the world. And that's been very consistent for a long time. And so in my mind, I'm thinking there has to be other people like this. And so that's why after I moved away from Japan, I just decided to travel for a while. And I figured I would go places where there were things that were indicators that showed that this is what, you know, people had a similar lifestyle to the people in Okinawa. So, you know, I went to India because Ayurvedic medicine is known there. And so yoga, meditation, so they have to have people there and they did and parts of Africa because, you know, there's a whole history of like African medicine uh, as it relates to herbal medicine. So went there, Peru, Honduras, p places like this. And everywhere I went, uh, I was essentially looking for the local village healer, meaning not somebody at a hospital or somebody with a white coat or credentials like somebody who had been passed down information from the previous generation and they were responsible for treating and healing their village. This is the person that I wanted to 
to sort of seek out and find because then they could walk me into the jungle or the for local forest and show me exactly what they do, how they grow it, how they pick it, how they harvest it, and then how they give it to the patient and why they give it to the patient. And so, you know, I did that for almost two years and then, um, you know, ended up coming back here. But like, that was probably the most, that was probably the most humbling and educational experience I've ever had. Because you gotta understand when I, when I walk into many of these places, sometimes they know like I'm from like the US and I have like a doctorate and that sort of thing. So, you know, but to walk into a space where like, I don't know what they know at all, is very humbling to, to walk into that space and say, hey, I'm just a student, I don't know anything. And so, um, yeah, yeah, man, just, you know, everywhere I went was just being an open book and a clear slate and learning what I could and then uh, going on to the next place, whether it was about physical healing or spiritual healing or emotional healing, uh, just whatever I could learn, I was willing to, to sort of uh, be open to. That's so awesome. You're making me, well, that and the, uh, COVID pandemic are making me just want to get on an airplane tomorrow and go anywhere. <laughs> yeah. Just take hey, me dude. away. <laughs> but of course, I mean, did you get to, obviously you probably learned a lot, so it'd be hard to ask you to answer that question thoroughly, but um, are you incorporating any of the things that you learn into how you work with patients? And also, do you have to do any things on the pharmacy side still, as far as, you know, giving out medications and things like that? Yeah, everything I learned that that resonated with me is definitely what I use when I work with people one on one. And a lot of what I learned was when I came back here to the US, or even before I left, I was looking into like herbalism pro, uh, programs and nutrition programs. And what was missing was this very integrated approach in terms of incorporating not only nature in the form of like food or herbs, but nature itself, like the process of nature. And that was for me what was missing. And so that's really what I learned in those years of like traveling was, you know, like seeing a patient and understanding that their stomach ache wasn't just a stomach ache, it was also part of this, um, the process or of them abusing their own intuition and their own love of self. And so incorporating that into the healing program, incorporating herbs into the healing program that address emotional issues. And that's another thing that, you know, like I didn't lear learn here that while I was out and about and traveling and learning was the importance of using certain herbs to do that because most people think that emotional healing can only be learned through therapy, but there's also herbs that are, are good for that as well to actually help with that process. Um, so- Amazing, anything we can readily get? Things like sage, like people know about sage in terms of like burning it inside of the house, but they don't also know that like sage is something that can be incorporated as an herb, you know, uh, especially if you have like emotions that are sitting in the seat of your gut, you know, things like that. I haven't worked in a pharmacy in a few years. Uh, this is pretty much what I do um, nonstop. It was very difficult for me to work in the pharmacy, but it was also rewarding in the sense that I felt like I was a rebel at the hospital. <laughs> like I was the one that who could still secretly educate people. The unfortunate thing is like people are going to end up at the hospital. And quite often the people who end up there, they will never hear anything about me because they're never gonna search for a guy who's selling plants and herbs. You know, like a lot of people don't, it doesn't trigger them to like think that way. And so like the hospital was a great middle ground for me to be able to sort of talk to people and guide them along this path out of the hospital. But I haven't worked uh, in the industry for a couple of years now. Got it. Okay. So I guess you're not as close to it anymore. So it's harder for you to answer this question, but have you seen prescribing habits change over the last few years? Like, is it pretty consistent with how it's always been? Is it more prescriptions are being given out less? Is there more awareness? 
I think in some areas there's less. Like um, you probably heard about the opioid crisis that was going on that is killing millions of people. So because of all of the litigation and the, the malpractice suits that have been filed on behalf of patients who were basically saying like, as a physician, you got me addicted to these opioids and you never gave me a way to get off of them. And so like, because of that, like physicians are less likely to prescribe opioids in a way that they prescribed them before. You know, in my opinion, they were giving them out as if they were Flintstone vitamins. And I'm not saying that because I'm on the other side of this. I'm saying that because I was always the person having to say, this person just got a prescription three days ago. And so in that regard, that's changed because the legislation around that has changed. But as far as other things, I'm seeing the same prescribing habits. I see patients who've are tired of the healthcare system and come to me and say, hey, I'm on 19 different medications. Is there anything that you can do for me? And I'm seeing the same issues with that same regimen, meaning duplicate prescriptions for the same um, illness. Uh, I'm seeing side effects as a result of mixing medications that shouldn't be mixed together. So Unfortunately, I, I, in some areas it's been improved and then in some areas it's really just the same song. Wow, that's depressing. And actually I, I read somewhere a couple months ago that though the opioid prescribing has gone down, it's still sort of shocking how high it still is given the risks. And I'm sure you've seen that as well. So what advice would you give to people given all of your experience and everything that you've learned? What would you say they should do if they're offered a prescription or they're prescribed something and they're really not sure about whether they should start it or take it? Ooh, man. So that's a loaded question with a lot of legality behind it. So I know you have to say like, what's appropriate. Yeah, so say, say very, that, get that out of the way and then tell us yeah. more. So it's going to be a very political answer, unfortunately. But what I can tell people is that choose your physician carefully. Okay. Um, there, you can choose a ND, which is a naturopathic doctor. You can choose a doctor who's more in, a, more in alignment with how you want to be healed. And so I always tell people, first start with that, okay? So that way he, they can always help you navigate that process, okay? Because one person's situation isn't the same as another person's situation. You may have somebody who has a completely deteriorated pancreas and they're producing no insulin. So the advice I would give that person versus the advice I would get a person who has a functioning pan pancreas is very different. So uh, I can't give like a, a blank answer because it's, first of all, it's irresponsible. And second of all, it's just, it is a, it's a mess. Um, but what I can tell people is that it's like I said before, make sure you ask questions. Okay, uh, let's say for instance, like it's high blood pressure. There are stages of high blood pressures. There's prehypertension, there's stage one, stage two, stage three, so forth. Okay, and in, within each stage, there's a blood pressure range that is sort of in alignment with each stage. Okay, now if you're one of the persons who are prehypertensive, then what I would urge you to understand is if you're prehypertensive, that means that your blood pressure is just above the normal, okay? For most of those people, they can make the lifestyle changes, even stage one can make the lifestyle changes necessary to sort of lower their blood pressure, okay? Now, when you creep up into the hypertensive crisis type of patients, those are the people who need somebody to get, guide them along the way. And I say that because you don't want to be eating cucumbers and thinking that your blood pressure is better and it's not, and you have a stroke. That's the worst thing could happen for that, that type of person. So you need somebody who can guide you along the way. So get guidance in that area. If you want to take a more natural route for most people, you know, I'm just being honest. Most people don't know enough about food. I mean, I always get that question. Like, you know, people are like, well, I see you're not eating meat. Or do you not eat meat? And no, I don't eat meat. And they ask why. And I was like, um, make sure you eat healthy. And they're like, oh, I eat really healthy. And then I asked them what they eat. And I'm like, 
no, that's that's not that's not healthy. Just think about it. When you go to your doctor, the advice that they give is really layman's advice when it comes to nutrition, because nutrition isn't required as a course in medical school. So the advice they're giving you is layman's advice. Okay, so it, take that in consideration. That's your doctor. You have to be humble yourself and ask yourself, what do I know about nutrition? And so if you don't know enough, you need guidance. And so I just recommend that people get guidance in that area because, you know, it's not always as easy to navigate those waters as people would like it to be. I have had many experiences like that myself where sometimes I think if somebody tells me they quote unquote eat healthy, they don't eat healthy. Right. Because just the idea that they're saying that to me is such a lack of understanding about how eating and nutrition works, which is that you could have a certain diet one week and have a completely different diet the next week because of being on the go or forgetting yep. to you know, go to the store when you were planning to or because you were traveling that week. And your bio, your whole biology and physiology can change uh, week to week, day to day, like it took you 17 days to change your, you know, hereditary, quote unquote, uh, you know, condition that you'd had for it sounds like over a decade. I mean, that's crazy. So um, to think that you can just kind of give a blanket that you eat healthy when it can probably does change so much um, throughout different phases of your life. And also, um, if you eat meals that are not prepared by you, you kind of only have a general sense of what's in them, but you don't right. really know much. And so you don't, you're not even at liberty to answer that question if you're eating out quite a bit because you don't really know what you're eating. Yep, yep. Um, especially if you're, you know, buying non-organic things where there could be, you know, over a hundred chemicals or a hundred fertilizers and pesticides that are made from chemicals on a particular piece of produce. I mean, that's that's crazy. It's hard to imagine. Right. So really, we have only a small idea of when we're holding, you know, a non-organic cucumber that this is a cucumber, but it's one of right. like a hundred things that you're holding. Right. <laughs> so I think that is so true. And I've seen that so much as far as like a real lack of understanding about what eating healthy means. And then usually because they got that information from people they thought they were supposed to trust. Right. It's like if you don't do your own research or you don't go deeper to find people like you and find people that we've, you know, other experts on the Wellbe platform um, that we've had before, that it's coming from a doctor who's not trained to talk about it, or it's coming from like People magazine, who again, layman's terms, misinformation, all that stuff. So basically your sources are just kind of not qualified to be sources. And therefore, it's always going to be outdated and always kind of be, you know, airing on whatever's going to sell the most food. Yeah. And I understand that although like as humans, like we're very similar, we all have two kidneys and two lungs and one heart and, you know, so forth and so on. We're very different in our biology and our biochemistry. And so you can't give the same advice to one person that you give to another because people are at a different stage in their journey in their biology and their biochemistry. Some people are very healthy. Some people are very unhealthy. Some people have hereditary things like I did. Some people don't. And so you can't give everybody this like fixed advice and expect everybody to do well with that advice. And that's why I mean by make sure you get somebody to guide you along the process is because everybody has this cookie cutter information that they're giving out to everybody, but it doesn't work for everybody. Everybody is different. The same way we ha all have different fingerprints, we do have some unique biochemistry and biologies that sort of separate us from each other and yeah. make us special. As you were saying that, I was just thinking as a nice way to sort of wrap up too, since we're getting to the end of our time together, the only thing that we know for sure is good for everybody as far as food are plants. Not every right. single plant, but at least, you know, we know for sure green vegetables and, you know, that kind of thing. Um, and most nuts and seeds and, and that. So that's the commonality between us. And that's kind of what you've dedicated your life to. And I think it's 
the most powerful thing we have. It's it's medicinal, whether it's in herb form or in food form. And for the modern toxic world that we're living in, it's also kind of the only answer um, for overpopulation, saving our soil, this chronic disease epidemic, climate change pollution, all of that. So my last question for you, and this has been so, so cool. You had as many cool things to say, given your experience um, and your training as I thought you would. So thanks. How do you quote unquote, get wealthy? So get wealthy is our website and all of our social platforms. And the idea of the get, you know, with Wellbe, which is the name of the company, is that health takes work. It doesn't just happen, especially today um, in the environment that we live in, as we've talked about a lot. So you sort of have to do certain things. And I'd love to know how do you get Wellbe as far as what you do that you absolutely don't miss the stuff that no matter how busy you are, if you're traveling, you make sure to do every day, you know, to ensure that you, you know, don't ever have another chronic health issue again. How I get wealthy. The first thing I do is first do no harm. Even in the Hippocratic Oath, that's part of the Hippocratic Oath, the original Hi Hippocratic host is first do no harm to the patient. Well, I'm asking you to be your own first doctor. So first do no harm to the patient do no harm to yourself. So look at the things in your life that are contributing to not a healthy, higher version of you. That's the first thing that people need to do. Because if you don't eliminate what is actually causing the harm in the first place, it won't matter how many apples, how many cucumbers, how much kale you eat if you're doing that, okay? So that's the first thing. The second thing I would tell people is that if it didn't come from the ground, put it down. And I know that's hard to, to sort of think in this world of so many options to eat only foods that have one ingredient, but at least make that the your foundations because it's just scientifically proven that if you eat more fruits, vegetables, nuts, and seeds, that you're going to be a healthier, happier human being. And that's what this life is all about, being healthy and happy, okay? And then I would say the third thing I'm always making sure I do and sort of to give people like a, a life hack is green smoothie. Um, because I think the best way in this society where everybody is on the go to sort of make sure that you're always incorporating health into your life is a green smoothie. Because you got to think about it, like at the base of a smoothie is liquid, so you're getting hydration. So maybe it's water. Maybe it's coconut milk, but you're getting hydration. Uh, then you put a green leafy vegetable in there. So now you're getting minerals, you're getting you know, chlorophyll, you're getting some phytochemicals, so that's great. Maybe you throw a herb in there that's a little bit tasty like basil. All right, so now you're getting some additional effects to remove heavy metals. You add some fruits in there and now you're getting some great taste to make your taste buds dance. And maybe you add in like some flax seeds or chia seeds to get some omega-3s that are gonna remove a little bit of that inflammation for your body. And you did that all in one cup. And so incorporating something like a green smoothie on a daily basis, even if your life gets away from you, at least you had that green smoothie for the day. So those would be like the three things that I would recommend people to sort of uh, make sure they're always wealthy. Thank you. That's awesome. Um, you have reminded me that I have not been making my smoothie enough this week because sometimes, you know, the, the vegetables aren't washed and it's so much faster to just right. throw the fruit in and it kind of tastes a little better. And so I don't always remember, but this is a great <laughs> reminder to reset, and get my greens in, in the smoothie. Also, because as you were saying it, I was like, a lot of people like to work out in the morning so that it's out of the way. Well, it's the same kind of medicinal effect on our bodies, right? So you get that smoothie out of the way. And then if you don't have as many vegetables as you want lunch and dinner, or you have, you know, some, but not a lot, you got it in. You're not, you know, still worrying, scrambling, trying to fit in something as healing as a green vegetable after dinner, yeah. right? Or, or at dinner. I love that. Well, thank you so much for this. Um, it's been so fascinating to hear. I mean, you're clearly such, like you said, such a love of learning. It's really impressive to see how much you love to learn because you've gone down paths that would firmly put you into the career path 
of what it was that you were trained in. And then you chose totally different things. And as if, you know, you hadn't gone to school enough, then spending two years learning more about, you know, what it took to be a healer with all these different ancient medicine modalities and, and herbal medicine, it just really takes somebody who has um, a lot of humility also, because you keep putting yourself in situations where you don't know what you're doing and you learn. Um, a lot of people, I think, once they learn something, they just want to keep doing it because they have authority and they feel comfortable, you know, in that role. So you really have to put yourself in uncomfortable situations to keep learning the way that you have and evolving what was supposed to be a normal pharmacy degree with everything you're doing now. I think it's it's really cool. So thank you for inspiring us today and for all of your information on medical error and, you know, tips on what to do when prescribed something um, and also just how to live and most of all, how to eat and eat plants. So thank you again. All right, you're welcome. Thank you for having me.